So good morning, Charged Up Studio listeners. I am so glad to have you here once again with us. This is Dana Olivo, your host and CEO of Market Atomy LLC. Now, this week's podcast is going to push the boundaries of traditional entrepreneurship a little. Not only because the subject matter is considered taboo among the general public, but because it epitomizes the struggle associated with breaking through preconceived perceptions when trying to gain a place in society. Caitlin Bailey is a contrarian by nature and a provocateur (laughs) by (laughs) trade. Bailey is an international touring stand-up comic, sex worker, rights advocate, and writer. Now, I did say that right. It's sex worker rights advocate and writer. She started the Oldest Profession podcast in 2017. And in 2018, she returned to politics to challenge laws criminalizing the oldest profession as the director of communications for decriminalized sex work. In 2020, Bailey founded Old Pros where she continues her stubborn crusade against (laughs) whorephobia. Bailey moved to New York City in 2010 to pursue a career in stand-up comedy. You have to be a comedian to be able to deal with the pressures of this. She produced a variety of shows at Stand Up New York Labs, The Popular Naked Show, At the Creek and the Cave, and performed regularly at bar shows and clubs all over the city. She was a regular at the infamous roast battles on the stand, and she sold out venues across the country with the Cake Comedy Tour. Today's podcast is going to focus on the challenges associated with creating advocacy around a difficult industry. So let's all give a warm, charged up studio welcome to Miss Caitlin Bailey with Old Pros. Good morning, Caitlin. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, <laughs> and, and thank you so much for, for reading my bio. I realize that there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in there that could tri- trip up uh, a, a regular citizen. So thank no. you. <laughs> no, d- definitely. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really not that it's a difficult su- subject it's just taboo mm-hmm. you know? absolutely and it depends on where you are in the world mm-hmm. you know, as to how taboo it is so before we get started tell our audience a little bit about how old pros got started sure you know i think like a lot of of founders and ceos and and entrepreneurs is that you know this really was started from a place of just uh spite and, uh, and, and ego, right? I felt very driven and I felt uh, contained, right? You know, and, and you introduced me beautifully as a, a contrarian by nature and a provocateur by trade. So I'm not sure if, uh, if, if it's that I really couldn't be managed in my, in my last role, um, if that was like a failing of my manager or if, that, if, or if I am just like an ungovernable employee, which of course forces us to start our own thing. But in my capacity as the director of communications for decriminalized sex work, I, uh, I was, um, I was working for a leader in at that point that I didn't respect. I didn't, uh, I didn't understand the tactics that were being deployed. I felt like there were a lot of bad choices. I felt like I didn't have control over the, uh, the communications, which was my, which was my purview, right? I wasn't dictating the message that was going out. And worse, um, for my boss, I felt like I did know what the answer was. I felt like I did know how I wanted to talk about this and how I wanted to be framing things, the kind of organization that I wanted to build in order to create the conditions to change the status of sex workers in society. Um, and after two years talking to legislators across the country with these, you know, sort of with, with one arm time ba- uh, with one arm tied behind my back, uh, I started my own organization in October of 2020, which was a really volatile period. Um, Everyone was already working remotely, but I walked away from my salaried position um, because I believed in my heart that I could do it better. And I bet on myself and recruited a team that was willing to make that same bet. And here we are. 
So you were in the industry prior to starting your own. Yes, I was in sex worker advocacy. I had been recruited as the founding director of communications and okay. and and felt like I was unable to really do my job uh, because of the the leadership limitations, the way that we had positioned ourselves um, sort of within sex worker advocacy. And also, most importantly, I felt like we'd zeroed in on the wrong target. I don't think that legislators or policymakers are going to lead on this. I think we have to invest in culture change. We have to change the way that we think and talk about the oldest profession um, and remind the electorate that sex workers have always been and continue to be an integral part of every community. You know, what, what are some of the kickbacks that you get, you know, in your efforts as far as creating advocacy around this? Okay. okay. I, I what are some it, of the kickbacks? Do, like, like bribes? What's a, I'm sorry. No, or, no, 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 oh, no. Or pushback, bribes. pushback. Push Got back. it. Yeah. Sorry. I think of kickbacks yeah. of like I'm the sorry, skimming off back. the top. That's okay. I was like, look, you know, my, my, I mean, my grandpa was in the, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, speaking of, of criminalized subcultures. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I describe, this is the oldest profession. It's also the oldest stigma, right? I believe that whorephobia is the foundation um, upon which misogyny sits. And there has been so much invested in denigrating, uh, you know, sex workers specifically, but really women and gender non-conforming folks more broadly, right? And so this idea that, um, that sexual chastity is the most important uh, virtue is, is an old idea that I think has really, really held back women's full participation in public life, right? Public woman has been synonymous, right? With the, 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 the denigrated, right? The, uh, the stigmatized prostitute for a long time, right? When the first woman to run for president in the United States Victoria Woodhull in 1870, right, was widely regarded as, uh, you know, as a, as, as a whore, you know, um, when Donald Trump called Hillary Clinton a nasty woman from the debate stage, he's participating in this sort of like age old um, sport, for lack of a better word, of like calling women that dare to stick their necks out, calling ambitious women, calling public women, women participating in public life, um, unchaste, sullied, devalued, dismissible. Um, and so in that way, this stigma really impacts all of us, whether or not we've ever actually literally participated in the trade. And I think that you see this most clearly in domestic violence, right? You know, I'm a survivor myself. I work with, I work with survivors and I don't know anyone who's ever been violently hit in a romantic relationship that wasn't called a whore, right? Yeah. Whether they engaged in that work or not. So this issue touches so many people in so many different ways, that sort of visceral response. So the, the reactions that I get are often from, you know, mainstream, well-meaning, often very well-resourced feminists, right, who just cannot imagine, um, and who have been pushing back against this idea of they themselves being threatened with this old stigma, right, and so they want to distance themselves. And also, you know, the, the usual suspects of folks that don't believe that women are fully autonomous people, right? So like, you know, anti-choice, uh, anti-feminists, um, anti um, you know, the folks that have invested in censorship as a, a metric of morality. And so, you know, we have a lot of enemies and they, you know, come from, from all angles. Um, but we also have a lot of supporters with a similarly broad ideological spectrum. Well, it sounds to me like what we're talking about here is more than just the act of sex for sex sure. yes. or sexual workers. What we're talking about here is the definite um, disparity between male and female and the way that we are treated as yes. females, you know, I mean, a perfect example is as you're growing up and there's a son and a daughter, the daughter is naturally treated differently and felt yes. as though they need to be protected as opposed to the male. 
Yes. I think that the big foundational belief that I want to push back against that I think impacts everyone is that little boys go out into this world and experience hard things and become better men. And that little girls go out into the world and experience hard things and become diminished or devalued or ruined in some way. And I think that that's a lie on both fronts, right? I think that we need to create more space for our boys to be hurt and scared And I think that we need to create more space for our girls to be bold and enterprising. And the the truth of it is that there is no amount or type or variety of consensual sex that you can engage in that diminishes or devalues anyone. And that that is not a place that we should be forcing or focusing the policing powers of the state. And that these old ideas that drive these old and these bad laws really do impact all of us. I know this as a historian. I know this as a comedian and an entertainer and a provocateur. And I know this as a, you know, as a woman trying to make my way in the world, these, these bad ideas that I should be limiting myself for my own safety or that sexual expression or erotic expression is synonymous in some way with violent exploitation is going to hold all of us back. And until we are ready to let go of those foundational lies, we are gonna continue to invest in policing people that we claim to want to be helping. Well, I mean, when you think about it, okay, um, what's, is, is the government, is, is the, On the political side, are they reacting more to um, uh, what what others are saying out there just to um, have something to fall back on or, you know, or something like that? Because we do have a great deal of people that, you know, you mentioned the word sex Mm -hmm. and immediately goes against their moral character, their moral, you know, all of this stuff. Yeah, but, just, you know, when you think about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I feel like that never holds up, right? Like I just, I, you know, not to be crass, but I am a comedian. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like really focusing on the way that people come was just like never a part of what Jesus spent his time thinking about, right? He had way more negative things to say about tax collectors than he did with the sex workers that he spent a considerable amount of time with. Right. And so if you're looking about, if you're looking at Christian values, right, if you're looking at family values, right, the overwhelming majority of sex workers are in fact single moms, right? This is a way for people to get the resources that they need to support their families. Sex work has funded more female entrepreneurship than all of the grants in all of the world combined. Um, If you want to talk about supporting people who are trying to help themselves, then the last thing that we should be doing is sending SWAT teams into immigrant owned businesses to arrest people for engaging in aggressively consensual hand jobs, right? It's just not a national security issue. So uh, we get pushback because people are afraid of sex and always have been. This comes back to our puritanical roots as a country. We have a long and well-documented history of wanting to criminalize and censor and focus on sexual expression, often at the expense Um, of dealing with real social issues, right? We say that we wanna protect girls. So we are trying to eliminate pornography on the internet, but we are not investigating reported rapes or treating domestic violence with the level, with the severity that it should be, right? So we are, so this issue becomes a real smoke and mirrors where people are allowed to pretend that they're doing something for our benefit, but it's all coming from this place of coercive control, right? We want to make sure that your skirts are long enough, but we're not really interested in, you know, preventing boys from saying uh, objectively rude things to you in public, right? We're not going to, we're not going to crack down on that behavior, but we, we can police what you wear. The fact that the (laughs) men. The fact of the matter is, you know, this would not be an issue if the men weren't out there buying. Mm. I want to push back on that. I, I, I do want to say right up front that people of all genders participate uh, yes. in this work yes. on both sides, right? Uh, you know, buyers and sellers. I will also say that uh, I think that cracking down or criminalizing or demonizing clients is a real problem. 
everywhere that we have seen so-called end demand, or maybe you've heard it referred to as like the Nordic model or the entrapment model, whenever these laws are actually applied in places like Norway, Sweden, Canada, Ireland, right. we see that violence against sex workers goes up. It re- no, no, it goes up. Violence against sex workers increases because it, it, because it reduces our negotiating power. Because if my, it's right, because sex work is sales, right? Mm-hmm. So whether I'm doing this by choice, circumstance, or control, or, or sorry, uh, choice, circumstance, or coercion, right? I need to be able to sell my services, whether it's to provide for my family, whether it's to buy something I have, you know, my eye on or because I'm operating in an abusive relationship, right? Whatever the reason, the need is still there, which is why basic supply and demand analogies don't really work for the sex workers because sex workers are coming to this work because they have a need that they need to fill. And I mean, you work in sales, I've worked in sales. Mm -hmm. The seller always needs it more than the buyer. That's the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And, And so when the buyer is criminalized, right? It makes them, uh, it makes them shadier, right? It makes them harder to screen and it gives them more negotiating power. So if someone refuses to engage in my screening services, right? They don't want to give me their real name. They don't want to give me industry references in a system that has criminalized clients. I don't know if, if that's because that's a reasonable person that doesn't want to provide evidence of a crime or if they're a predator posing as a client trying to take advantage of me and lure me into a vulnerable situation. And so when you criminalize clients, you reduce the negotiating power of sex workers, you push the entire industry further underground, and we know what prohibition does to markets. It does not make them safer. Okay, okay. It, it's also, sorry. Yeah. yeah. One more thing about this is that in the entire purpose of so-called end demand laws, is to eradicate the erotic industry, right? So it's it's really hard to help people that you're hunting, right? It's hard to help people where you're like, my, my first position is that you shouldn't exist, right? And so when you're coming from the position that engaging in, in sex work is universally exploitative or is universally some form of self-harm, right? That people that engage in this are suffering from like false consciousness, that incentivizes people to uh, fire sex workers if they're outed, to evict them from their homes, or to remove custody of their children, right? This further incentivizes sex workers to run from the police, hide their occupation from their community, and doesn't provide any access to exit services. So yeah, end demand laws are, are a real problem. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So, you know, um, as, as we were talking about earlier, you know, we talked about some of those areas that, you know, um, have, we have reduced or lifted the laws against, Mm -hmm. and you said that the, um, the abuse numbers went up. Absolutely. Yeah, Ireland actually just released a scathing report based on over a decade of trying these laws. And the numbers really couldn't be clearer. There's more violence targeted at sex workers. Uh, and yeah, absolutely, more, more violence. These laws have made the conditions working within the sex industry less safe mm. by every imaginable metric. Wow, okay. Yeah. Okay. So in, in the history of you being an advocate and, mm-hmm. and, you know, communicating this issue, okay, what are the, some of the most challenging oppositions that you've gotten here in the U.S.? I think the, the most challenging and enduring opposition comes from women who believe that they are helping other women by trying to further criminalize and stigmatize this work, right? So when people believe in their heart of hearts that any exchange of erotic labor for money is an existential threat to one's soul, for example, right? Then they're willing to bulldoze past the bodily autonomy and human rights of the people engaged in this work in order to stop it. And so that's why you see so-called feminist actors, right, who are aggressively supporting and championing 
the violent arrest of some of the most vulnerable women in our communities. But aren't we just making them even more vulnerable? Absolutely. I think the Robert Kraft uh, sting in South Florida is a really good example of this, right? So in that particular case, you had five different law enforcement agencies all working together for more than six months to install hidden cameras and uh, and spy on these immigrant-owned, mostly women-owned um, Asian massage parlors throughout South Florida that were on occasion providing sexual services, right? Robert Kraft was one of over 200 men that was sort of caught up in this sting that was widely reported, right, as breaking up an international sex trafficking ring. And we've embarrassed all of these traffickers and these abusive men are gonna have their, have their day in court. Well, upon uh, further discovery, there was no evidence uh, of any kind of coercion or trafficking or violence. Nope, everyone involved was a legally licensed masseur. The youngest person involved was 32 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, like these are adult women who are, you know, negotiating services. Right. And and law enforcement agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, spent untold amounts of money and time. Right. Watching what I can only assume is like the world's most boring porn. Right. Happening in these massage parlors. Right. But they arrested all of these people and the only charges that stuck were against the 19 women who were actually providing services. So they were charged with, you know, offenses relating to prostitution, right? All of these men were publicly embarrassed, but the the charges didn't stick because they weren't actually doing anything wrong. Wow. Wow. And I'm sorry to say, like, as somebody who has both sold sexual services, right, I'm somebody who has had lived experience. I've been in a domestic violence relationship and I've, I've been sexually assaulted. And I will tell you that those are very different things. Negotiating a session with an enthusiastic client is very different than being violently assaulted. And when we conflate those two things, we're doing a real disservice to everyone. Right, right. Right. So it's your belief or is it your belief that the sex trade has a place in society, but that it's a choice? Absolutely. I mean, the the sex trade is older than fiat currency. You know what I mean? This is a foundation. Mary Magdalene, you know, and all that. Absolutely. Mary Magdalene is a perfect example. I mean, you go back to some of our oldest societies. I mean, sex work is everywhere that you look for it. This is something, I mean, This is something that predates us as a species. Penguins and certain species of monkeys engage in this work. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it is innate. I feel like it's a red herring, something that we just decided uh, to be afraid of, mostly because it's one of the most effective tools to demonize women, right? Um, And it's been used to sort of oppress all of us. And I, yeah, I absolutely think that not only are sex workers not doing anything wrong, but are truly valuable contributors uh, to their to their communities. And that's played out in the history. You know, sex workers have been nurses. Sex workers are often on the, the front lines of, of wars. We have had more freedom of movement than most other women in society. We've, been, we've made history uh, because of our willingness to break social mores. We often sort of create shelters for other vulnerable people. Sex workers are innovators um, in mutual aid. We're also innovators in in sort of every major financial and technological development in the history of the world. Sex workers have a lot to add to the communities that we're already in. But because of this history of stigma and shame and silence and the real repercussions that come from outing yourself to your community, we're all missing out on the great wisdom that we could be contributing. Right, right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what you see moving forward as far as advocacy for this. Where do you see this going? So I'm, I'm optimistic, right? And, and founders always are, right? You don't start a business, uh, you don't start an organization unless you think that you can, you can really move the needle on this. And according to public policy polling last year, of the electorate is ready to decriminalize sex work and 22% 
consider themselves undecided, which I think demonstrates a real opportunity to educate people um, about why arresting people for, uh, you know, engaging in uh, negotiated consensual uh, erotic exchange is like at best not a great use of taxpayer money. Right now, our GDP is so damn high. Right. Exactly right. Like this is best case scenario. This is a waste of money. Right to say nothing of like the real human suffering that comes at the hands of 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 these arrests. But on the other hand, you know there. Uh, uh, Lindsey Graham has reintroduced the Earn It Act, right, which uses um, sort of tropes and myths uh, around human trafficking that's really sort of grounded in this like white slave law anxiety from the early 19th century. Um, excuse me, the, the early 1900s. Uh, so I was maybe that's the early 20th. I'm a historian and I still get that one wrong. It's yeah. confusing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 20th century there, not the 20th century, early 20th yeah. century. Um, so we're using this fear of sort of like stranger danger, right? Somebody is going to come and, and kidnap, right? Your child in order to justify eradicating freedom of expression and privacy on the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's really dangerous. I think that we live in an increasingly surveilled society. So I think that things that once were hidden are now revealed. And if we continue to conflate adult consensual uh, sex mm -hmm. with violent exploitation, then that's gonna be a problem for, for a lot of different folks. You know, we're already seeing, um, we're already seeing the impact of that. And what we're not seeing is any victims being supported, right? Any folks getting the things that they actually need, the building blocks to move their lives forward. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're seeing a lot more criminalization censorship and surveillance on already over-policed communities. Very good, very good. So you're an author too, right? I am a writer. Um, yeah, I, so as a, you know, all, all stand-up comics are writers because we, yeah. <laughs> we write our own jokes. Uh, <laughs> so I've also been published in, um, in Vice. I've been quoted uh, really extensively. I've published with the, the Daily Beast. Um, I'm working on a memoir now. Uh, and I'm editing my, my father's memoirs. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we're coming up on the end of another program here. And Caitlin, can you tell our audience how they can get a hold of you or where they can find more information about your, your advocacy programs? Absolutely. You know, our, our mission at Old Pros is really to, to educate and to introduce folks to this issue that maybe haven't thought about it before. Right. So if you are interested in learning more about sex worker rights related news, um, the way that sex workers are thinking about or framing the political issues of the day, you should sign up for our newsletter at oldprosonline.org. You can also follow us across social media at Old Pros Online. Um, and please consider making a tax deductible donation if you learn something today or if you uh, see how this if you can see how this issue uh, impacts all of us. Very good, very good. So that's it, folks. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Make sure to leave a review on whatever podcast delivery platform you are on, or go to our Charged Up Studio Facebook page and leave a review there. If you want to learn more about the different topics and skill sets associated with growing successful businesses, visit our online e-learning platform, marketatomy.academy. I look forward to talking with you once again next week for another exciting episode where businesses get charged up for success. And thank you once again, Caitlin, for bringing this different point of view to the stage here. Talk to you later. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>